You're listening to Dodge Movie Podcast. Your hosts are Christy and Mike Dodge, the founders of Dodge Media Productions. We produce films and podcasts, so this is a podcast about films. Join them as they share their passion for filmmaking. Welcome back, everybody, to this episode of Dodge Movie Podcast. Today, we are talking about probably one of my favorite Christmas movies. I did our social media post for today, and this one just, I remember as a teenager having slumber parties, and you get giggling, and you just laugh so hard, and it, there's something about it. It's like part exercise, part just euphoria, and as an adult, I just don't, I don't get those moments very much. But when I watched this movie for the first time, it was one of those, I laughed so hard, I like stopped breathing for a second. And very healthy. <laughs> I'm sure that for some people, maybe that would induce panic. But for me, that's just a good time. Not the stopping breathing, but just laughing so hard that you're just having a good time. Good times. <laughs> so anyway, before we do that, I want to announce a couple things. So as our Christmas gift to you guys, if you're interested in getting a list of all of the films that we talked about this past year, I have that that I would be happy to send you. It's a free PDF. I made it all cute and movie like and everything. And we have decided on all of the films that we're going to talk about in 2022. And so if you want a sneak peek as to what those are, email me at Christy at DodgeMediaProductions.com. And I will send out one or both. You let me know what what you want and I'll send it out to you completely free. Our gift to you. Free of charge. Free of charge. And then you can watch ahead or if you missed any, it's all in one place. It's all cute. I promise. And it's our gift to you. So thank you. We would also love for you to call in. It's not too late, even though it's the third week of December. It's not too late. Go ahead and email us or send me a voicemail to the phone number 971-245-4148 and tell us what your Christmas movies are. Tell us the ones that you love to watch. Tell us the ones that make you happy, make you sad, make you wistful, make you nostalgic. Just if we haven't talked about it, tell us. So we've had a couple people volunteer already. We've got some votes for Christmas with the Cranks. That's uh, Tim Allen and Jamie Lee Curtis joint, if I remember correctly. Yes. As well as Natural Lampoon's Christmas. And we've also had more than one spirited discussion here in the studio about whether Die Hard and Lethal Weapon are Christmas movies. So there's a wide gamut available. It doesn't have to be strictly the Santa Claus. You can go off script if you want. Right. And we haven't gotten very many what I would call G-rated Christmas movies. No, and you would think there would be tons of G-rated Christmas movies. Right, but nobody's really said like The Grinch or... Hmm. Do you mean the animated one or the Jim Carrey one? Well, I guess technically both would count, but I was thinking, you know, as a kid, we all watched the animated. Yeah. 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 So anyway, there we go. I think that is all of my announcements. I want to just mention, I really appreciate when people send us feedback. But since you listen to the episodes out of the order that we record them, if you could give us a little heads up about what ep you're talking about when you give us feedback, that would help tremendously. Yes. And actually, per our conversation about the sleigh that Papa Elf shows Buddy in the episode we talked about Elf, favorite listener Lee Gokenauer sent me this. This is my rant about the Kringle 3000 versus the G85. The G85, although has significantly more thrust, I believe runs on standard fuel, whereas the Kringle 3000 probably runs on hot chocolate and cookies and probably even a little bit of holiday magic in there. So it would be more readily available to refuel at the North Pole before his trip. That's actually a good point, longtime listener Lee, that Avgas could be difficult to get up there. And I'll be honest, I'm not sure how it responds to temperature, whereas we're pretty confident we know the temperature of hot chocolate if you're fueling up with that. So good thinking on your part, Lee. Logistics really separates the the, the savvy person from the layman. Now, I know Lee is such a favorite listener. He listens to our episodes either on Sunday or Monday. So I believe I, yes, I did receive this on a Monday. So I knew he was talking about the Elf episode, But we have gotten comments texted to us weeks after we have recorded episodes with just 
people launch into their question or they launch into (laughs) their comment and it takes us a minute to kind of derive, oh, I think they're talking about the Welcome to Mooseport episode. Right. And sometimes when we ask follow-up questions of those dedicated listeners, you know who you are, we love you. (laughs) They don't remember what ep either. So (laughs) the conversation is kind of blind leading the blind at that point. So. Okay. I had to share that. Thank you for your Uh, We we appreciate everybody who does give us feedback, though. Okay, one last thing before we launch into this episode. I want to take some time to thank two hardworking people who this podcast would not be in your ears right now if it weren't for them. One is our favorite editor, Jeff Freimuth, who I have known for, I think we're nearing on seven years now. Yeah, I would have gone five at least. Yeah. Yeah. And he is a great person. I can't talk highly enough of Jeff. I met him in film school. I think we did a project together, one of my first terms. And he was a hustler. He was a worker. He impressed me so much. And I've brought him on on just about every project I've ever worked on. And he has been editing this for us almost the whole time. And I can't thank him enough. It's taken a huge weight off my shoulders. He's a fabulous editor. He's on time. He communicates fabulously. And Jeff, thank you so much for making DMP, the podcast, a success this year. I just want everyone to know how hard you work. And I really, really, really appreciate it. And I'm grateful that you're part of the team. Thanks a lot, Jeff. And favorite niece, Melissa. Well, I guess I shouldn't say favorite niece because she has a sister. Yeah, but, sorry, Sarah. <laughs> Oopsie. Favorite niece, Melissa, that does social media for us. And that's one more thing that is lifted off of my shoulders. So all of those cool graphics that you guys see on our social media, that is thanks to Melissa Villagrana. And I am just so, so, so grateful to her for lifting that load off of me so I don't have to spend time making them. And they're just there and they're ready for me to post. So Thanks to our team here at Dodge Media Productions. And thanks to you, Mike, for making this fun and making me laugh and having a great time. And I fall in love with you even more after every episode that we record. Well, thanks for being the straight man to my wisecracker. (laughs) I'd also like to give a shout out to Whiskey Jack and Thor, (laughs) our studio doggies, for keeping the crowds back. You know, the, the, the dozens or hundreds of people that are crowding our, our studio, <laughs> our fans, you know, the paparazzi, et cetera. It's right. good to keep them back. We have the window here. It's like the Today Show. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a task. That's actually true. Maybe uh, we could have a contest and a uh, longtime listener, Lee, could, could sit out there and, and hold up signs and such. <laughs> Be our Today Show audience. All right. Enough of that. Let's see. Oh, my gosh. I was going to say we've done 10 minutes, but this Easily. will get edited down. Okay. Let's launch into Four Christmases. This is directed by Seth Gordon, not Seth Rogen. And he is known for King of Kong, A Fistful of Quarters. He also directed that documentary, if any of you geeks out there remember that one. It stars Vince Vaughn, Reese Witherspoon, Robert Duvall, Sissy Spacek, John Voight, John Favreau, Mary Steenburgen, Tim McGraw, Kristen Chenoweth, Dwight Yoakam, and that's it. And Katie Mixon, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's not really it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good ad. It was written by Matt Allen. It takes place in the Bay Area and it was filmed in San Francisco, Santa Clarita, which is that? That's Southern California, though, right? I, would, Santa I think Santa Clarita is a lot further south. Yeah, yeah, I think that's where the Dax Shepard Bless This House was filmed. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Twin Peaks in San Francisco, parts of LA, parts of Oakland, parts of San Francisco, like I said. It's a couple struggles to visit all four of their divorced parents on Christmas Day. And the tagline is his father, her mother, his mother, and her father all in one day. Or four families, one day, no mercy. That's better. (laughs) Mike, what's our pickup line? Hi. (laughs) That's it. (laughs) So it really puts pay to my theory that the first line of the film is important to set up the film. So I will say, though, that they flip it around a little bit in the sense of supporting my theories, because at the end of Act One, they explicitly state the premise of the film with the dialogue. We have to go to all four families in one day. Do you have any idea what that means? Do you have any idea what you've committed us to? And we just have to get through these four Christmases as quickly and painlessly as possible. It shows it right there. 
Wow. I, I didn't, I missed that. That's in act one though. You're about 20 minutes in. Right. So you kind of skipped ahead. Should we go back and talk about the opening scene? We certainly can. Okay. So in this opening scene, it appears as if Reese Witherspoon's character, Kate, Kate. and Vince Vaughn's character, Brad, Brad, that they don't know each other. It's like they're meeting in a bar for in a the bar. first time. Mm hmm. But then we quickly discover that they actually do know one another. And this is something that they do to kind of spice up their relationship or at least keep it spicy, would you say? Yeah, I think this is partly, this is setting up that they are really focused entirely on themselves, that they have the time to do role playing, you know, on a Tuesday, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing else really going on for them. So credit to the, sets because the kind of condo in San Francisco they put them in is this this giant huge and obviously unrealistic expensive yeah <laughs> unrealistic yeah so you can tell that they don't have any children they don't really have like hobbies they play backgammon but they, they you know they, don't, they it's not like they have pottery wheel in the corner or anything these are people who are rolling in in coin and this is kind of what they do but y you also i have to say get a very classic kind of hookup scene in the restroom of this bar. And there's a point here where I need to check in with costume designer Miriam. She pulls his dress shirt open, and I don't understand how that could be that when they do that, the buttons fly everywhere, and then later on, he's able to button his shirt back up. It doesn't make any sense to me. It's a Christmas movie. They're magic buttons. Oh, right. Just kind of <laughs> Santa Claus. Got it. That was, that was what I missed. There you go. Don't, Miriam, you can, you can rest. I took that yeah, one Rest for easy. You. Yeah, she got that one for you. <laughs> But you quickly see the height difference of a, what, six, five? Vince 15 Vaughn? inches height difference between Reese Witherspoon <laughs> and Vince Vaughn. So I put that under cinematography, how they managed to get them in frame at the same time. Now, I thought there's probably two Apple boxes involved, not just the one. That's a lot of height difference. Yeah, it's, it's obvious at the door. There's a couple times throughout the film, usually when they're about ready to kiss, and it appears that they put her on an apple box because he doesn't have to like bend over so far that he gives himself scoliosis or anything. <laughs> Which, oddly enough, reminds me of an outtake from, I think it was the Scorpion King. Michael Clark Duncan had to get on a horse and I saw an outtake. They actually just stood an apple box on its end so he could eat more easily get his foot in the stirrup. And I thought, what a brilliant idea of people on set. Don't make your actor hurt himself trying to launch himself on top of this giant horse. Just mm -hmm. give him a step. Mm -hmm. So I think they probably did the same for Reese. And you were talking about the end of act one where they tell us what the movie's about. But throughout the scene in the bathroom right after they have a date, we see what they were doing. We get an explanation as to why they're acting like they didn't know each other. Then they go to a dance class and that's where they are confused as an engaged couple by the other dancers and they explain, oh, no, 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 we're never getting married. That's too complicated. And we get to hear their theories and their, you know, philosophies on married versus just dating. And then they go to a work party where they pretty much explain that, oh, no, we don't go to our family's homes for Christmases. We go away on a vacation and we tell them we're doing charity work and then we get to skip all four Christmases. So this is in the, I guess, department of by the premise, by the bit. They didn't really like their families that much. I don't think it was established why they felt the need to lie to them. Well, I think that there's a dance that a lot of families do where I think there was love between the families because I think we see that near the end of the movie. But I think sometimes there are some people it's just easier to just kind of like avoid them. So I don't think it's that they didn't like their families. I just think their families were a lot, as we will go on to explain. Right. And so I think they were just choosing to kind of avoid that largeness that is often, and just this trickiness. I mean, I'm thinking of a bunch of different scenes. So right. does that help you, what you were thinking? Well, a little bit. I think part of it comes from, in my opinion, guessing, because I don't know the screenwriter. There's a line in there that occurs a couple of times that I think feels to me like it could have been a line of dialogue that he envisioned in his mind before he got working on the script at all. And that's, you can't spell families without lies. <laughs> right. it's, it's a I think, yeah, that shows what he thinks of families. Exactly. And 
and then it pops up more than once in the dialogue in the film, mm-hmm. as well mm-hmm. as conceptually. So, I, I mean, to me, that is, in a sense, a better logline, right, yeah. for the film in that it, it really captures the essence of, of what we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then we have a backgammon scene. They're playing, like you said, they're playing backgammon and they're displaying how much they care for one another because like one of them booked a massage. I think she booked a couple's massage for them. And he says, oh, thanks, honey. And then he says to her that he got her those new noise canceling headphones that she wanted. And so it's just they're taking so much care. And then there's this, you know, obnoxious packing montage where they're throwing (laughs) tropical attire everywhere. And up until that point of the film, I feel like these are both a personality like the the apartment is neat and tidy. It's very minimalist. They're very organized people. And so to just have this like devil may care. (laughs) <laughs> tropical, you know, music playing and, and just clothes flying everywhere. It seemed a little bit out of place. Well, first of all, anytime you play Buster Poindexter is feeling hot, hot, hot. I mean, you right. got to have a <laughs> montage where people throw clothes. Tip of the cap to the costume department, because I loved Brad's outfit to go to Fiji, a cheesy blue Aloha shirt and cheesy orange Aloha jams. Uh-huh. I'm sorry, it was a great sight gag, but based on the amount of money they make and their professions, I can't imagine he would actually wear that. But it was, you know, to, to, to show the difference between the two. I was going to ask you, though, there's a scene, I believe it's before the packing montage, when they're in bed talking. Did you also see a callback to, it was the Diane Keaton movie, Baby something, where and Harold Ramis is her partner at the time. Mm-hmm. And I kind of felt like that it was a bit of a callback to that. Baby boom. Baby boom. That they were type A overachievers, who like focused on their career to set up, you know, the whole premise of family or not. I didn't get that. But it, now that you pointed out, I see it. Yeah, I okay. see that. Yeah, yeah. So they head to the airport all ready to go. Their plan and anybody who lives in the Bay Area or has flown in or out of San Francisco There's a ton of fog and all flights are delayed. And as somebody who lived in the Bay Area for about three years and would fly back home to Oregon, I started flying out of San Jose because I got tired. I think it took two flights. One was like, oh, okay, that was a fluke. And the second was, oh, duh, it's San Francisco. There's a ton of fog. (laughs) Let me start flying. It was worth the drive an hour south to San Jose because miraculously it's crazy that you know i guess you're that far away from the bay that it, their airport wasn't affected and so it was just kind of like i feel like if they if you lived in san francisco you would start doing that also although but then we wouldn't have to, a movie <laughs> can you get to fiji from san jose ah uh, good point good point all right touche and what's fun is peter billingsley the boy from <laughs> the christmas story which nobody has mentioned that my mom brought that one up the other day favorite listener Sandy Serpa said, what about the Christmas story? That used to be like a big Christmas movie. Yeah. Somebody knew in college that was their family's Christmas tradition. I'll be honest. I've seen it, I think twice and didn't even think of it either. I know. And I used to always watch it every year too. So there we go. There's another one for everybody. Anyway, he's a little boy in it, but he's a grown up, and he's good friends with both Vince Vaughn and John Favreau. So for those in the know in the Favreau verse, It was not surprising (laughs) to see him there, but there he was. So that was kind of fun. Little Easter egg. And it immediately begins to tear him apart. The fact that now that there's fog and their flight gets canceled, now they start fighting. Like there's just conflict. Like you said, I think this is maybe where I noted the happening to coordinate and visit all four families. They just, they start fighting. Well, there's, there's a tension in the relationship we find out later because Brad's character is firmly anti-children, but Kate's character is maybe not quite so much, right? So there's that little difference, and we don't see it right away. We don't have evidence that it comes up, but I think that's part of the difference when they get to, I think it's his house, and he's working on the code word mistletoe, which (laughs) means that you can leave, and they're in the car, and he's going through, okay, say mistletoe, and, and so he says, what's the word? She says mistletoe. And he's like, okay, we can leave now. Right. Yeah, right. He, so yeah, he, he really doesn't want to. And, and she says, oh no, you know, it's family. We should go in. So I think there's already, they're setting up the, the a little bit of difference between the two characters. 
So the first Christmas that they go through is to his father's house, where his brothers are living with one of his brothers, played by John Favreau, is married to Katie Mixon, and they have a little baby girl, and she's pregnant. And then Tim McGraw plays his other brother, and I love it. They're Denver and Dallas, which is <laughs> where they were conceived, which I right. think is taking a little shot at Ron Howard. Yeah. Because, hey, watch out, Opie. Yeah. <laughs> That's where we learn that Vince Vaughn's character, Brad, his real name is Orlando. (laughs) Orlando. (laughs) And brothers Denver and Dallas are W. See, I'm laughing just talking. Yeah. There's a line where he says they're semi professional cage fighters. And to my knowledge, you're either professional or not. Like, either you get paid or you don't get paid. So it was a funny line to say semi-professional. And he walks in, and I think the first time we see Jon Favreau, he just does this, like, growl, and he just says, Welcome to the Octagon, son! Yeah. (laughs) And just tackles his brother. And he's got, like, the RVCA or or one of those classic t-shirts of the time, right? Yeah. And I really credit again to our set designer, Uh because if you notice, as you do when you've seen this film a half dozen times or more... (laughs) There are posters for the Extreme Cage Fighting Alliance, and there's, I think, even trophies and stuff throughout Robert Duvall's character's house right. from the ECFA, which is awesome. Semi-professional <laughs> cage fighters. John Favreau has like a skull ring on every finger of both hands. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then his his eating of wings later in the film is, 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 is comic gold. Yes, yes. So just the broad strokes. There's a little mishap with the spending limit. Brad spills the beans about, I'll just say, a Christmas secret that everyone holds dear. And so that causes some problems. And Well, not going into kind of what the the, the secret is, but I think that is important in the scene to show how disconnected he is from being a parent. Yes. Right? Yeah. He had no clue what he was doing. Yeah. His brother, played by Tim McGraw, very much had a clue. And there's a great scene where one of the kids streaks and... I have the line that Katie oh, Mixon thank you. says. Yeah, so his mom, played by Katie Mixon, says... So the little boy is so distraught by this news, he just starts stripping off all his clothes and runs off camera. And she says, when he gets to hurting inside, he can't use his emotion words. He takes to streaking. <laughs> <laughs> and again, uh, call out to the costume designers... Because, um, for you know, for decency, he has his underpants on when he goes out the window. But then there's a, you know, a, a, a oh, yeah. funny shot as his underpants come flying back, back in. through the window, yeah. And they're maroon. And to me, that's a funnier color. I don't know oh, if there's a ranking. But if they're just white underpants, I don't think it would have been as funny. <laughs> maroon underpants. Wing! Through the window. And then you hear Robert Duvall say, let's open some more presents. I'm starting to lose my buzz over here. <laughs> So if you get a a sense by my uh, doing some accents, which I usually don't do. um, Yeah, very brave. Yeah, I know. I'm not usually, I guess Southern I feel comfortable with. (laughs) None of the others I'm going to do. Well, you must still have your buzz on then. Right. (laughs) So they open a satellite dish for Robert Duvall. And of course, Kate, because she's organized, she's already arranged that the installer is going to come on Monday and install it. And Robert Duvall will have none of it. And this scene is one of those there. Oh, I meant to look this up because there has, I guarantee there's a name in, in filmmaking. And it's just one of these chaos scenes where there was a children's book I had called A Bug Went Hachu. And it set off a series of events that ended up in this catacomb, cataclysm, cataclysmic. Yeah, that <laughs> just chaos ensues. And this is one of them. And this is one of those scenes that just I stopped breathing because I was laughing so hard the very first time I saw this because it's just like this is happening and then this is happening. It sets off this and then it sets off this and it concludes with poor Reese. I think one of our first head traumas. Oh, well, no, probably not the first since uh, Orlando got tackled by Denver and Dallas. Well, the, I, I didn't make note of the other head traumas, including chokings and fish hookings and all of those things. Right. But this is the classic when Kate whacks the baby's head into the door jam. Mm-hmm. And I, I have no evidence that this was an inspiration for a similar scene in The Hangover. But 
it's just it's, it's painful. And, and so it, it's funny, of course, because no actual baby was harmed. No baby. It was a doll. Everybody, everybody calm down. No. So needless to say, that Christmas did not go very well. They cut to them in the car and they're going over it. And she says, why didn't you tell me your name was Orlando? <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I think is amazing from a filming perspective is it feels to me like this first Christmas is maybe a little bit more number of minutes than some of the other Christmases. But I think it's important to establish some of the, what's going on. And it is pretty funny. Yes. And I don't think based on where they would have to go for the exteriors, I don't think you could do all four of these Christmases in one day. Yeah, it's it's going to be pretty rough, I think. Especially, yeah, because the second one takes a, a good amount of time. Well, because they go to church. You yeah, know, like, they, there's a performance. Yes. <laughs> okay, so let's roll into it. So second Christmas is Kate's mom. And she warns of the cougar's den that he's about ready to walk into. <laughs> and she does not uh, understate it. Not only is her mother, played by Mary Steenburgen, lusting after Brad, but so does the two aunts and the grandmother. <laughs> right, everybody's going after poor old Brad. Now, I will mention, speaking of this family, great casting because Kristen Chenoweth is only a few inches shorter than Reese Witherspoon. The, right. So they, they, they really do look like sisters. Yeah, they play sisters and... There's a jump jump, which I'd never heard it called that, but maybe... Um, Bouncy house is what we always call yeah, it. Yeah, maybe that's a trademark name, so they had to call it the jump jump. <laughs> that's good. And we find out that Kate hates these entertainment vehicles, I guess, because when she was a kid, people used to call her Cootie Kate, I guess when she was inside the jump jump. Yeah, you know, as you spoke about that, I'm not exactly sure how the jump jump got linked into that. From my perspective, though, the, the the humor really comes from her inadvertent lesbian relationship during <laughs> high school. Right. So poor Kate, this, I mean, who hasn't had this when you bring your beau home and they start bringing out the family albums and showing all the embarrassing pictures of you and telling all the horrible, embarrassing stories that you don't want anyone to tell you, like that people used to call her cootie Kate. And, mm -hmm. and you can tell that to a certain extent, this still bothers Reese. Like she... Not only doesn't like the jump jump, but she doesn't like being called, doesn't like being reminded that people called her cootie Kate. Right. And there's lines like, you're the longest relationship she's ever had with a man. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so that's a little rough for Brad to hear. And then, well, Joe wasn't gay. Haircuts don't lie. <laughs> and then he says, you're better kiss her for it. Which, you know, I, I don't know that your husband making jokes about that would really be the way you would want to come to the realization that maybe Joe had more than just, you know, platonic feelings for you. So that whole thing is just really going south. And then her mother, played by Mary Steenburgen, is now dating the, the pastor at this rock and roll church. But before we go to the oh. rock and roll oh, church, oh, right, I just... Before. Right, before we go there, there is a scene where Kate oh, is yeah. holding... <laughs> this is another one of my favorite scenes. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> where Kate is holding her, her niece, her sister's baby, and so, like you said, we're starting to see that, you know, this is the second time Kate's hold, held a baby in this movie. And so she is, you know, kind of, you, we see in her eyes, she's kind of having a little bit of a baby gaze, kind of, you know, you could say she's looking at the baby. And, yeah. But the baby projectile vomits all over her. And what is hilarious is not only do all of the female, you know, the, the aunts and the grandma and her mother go to Brad who is is <laughs> overwhelmed by the disgusting smell and look of what is all down the front of Kate. But he is telling Kate, go in the other room, go in the other room. I would do it if I were you. You have to get out of here. <laughs> and she's just frozen, having been thrown up on by this baby and, and, and the mess is on her. But all of the attention, which I think we see that this is what her experience in her family was, is she wasn't seen. She wasn't acknowledged. People cared about other people's concerns over hers. And she's just like, I can't believe this is happening to me. I'm the one that got thrown up on, but they're more worried about Brad. Well, this also dovetails into, I think, the, the church scene in that Brad is kind of a narcissist, right? It's all about him. And perhaps Reese Witherspoon would argue that Vince Vaughn, the actor, is also right. a narcissist. Yes, you read in some trivia that these two did not get along during the making of this film. For those of you who have access to Dinner for Five, which is a John Favreau joint as well, it was a series, 
And on one of the apps, Vince Vaughn is there and Peter Falk is also at the table. And, and I will say, I think Peter Falk had the same quibbles with Vince's approach to acting that Reese did. Mm. Um, I, I think Vince is a very organic, naturalistic kind of, of actor. And those who have more classic training, I think it, there's a lot of friction there. Right. So Kate goes in the bathroom. There's a whole jump, jump scene. And she actually finds a pregnancy test in her sister's diaper bag and she takes it, which we had. This was definitely a reason to pause for us, because I said, why would you pee on a pregnancy test if you didn't think that you were pregnant? But then much later, she explains that. But I always thought that that always bumped me when I watched it the first time. Like, why would you just, oh, let me find, oh, let me pee on this. I just. So as you were talking earlier in this episode, it dawned on me that they hook up in that bar restroom oh. and she maybe pulled the goalie in that situation. Oh. And I didn't even think of that, but anonymous sex in a bar restroom tends not to have much protection involved. So I was curious. I would love to talk to the director and the screenwriter, which and call in if you if you want. Except for I feel like somebody. Oh, I see. You're saying maybe she'd stop taking the pill. Somebody like her, I think, would have like the Nuvo ring or the the thing you put in your arm. Or I feel like she would have had something that wasn't a per event precaution. Right. Except he, he, there's a point there where he says she pulled the goalie, did actually use that phrase, which I think many women really think the, the, the beauty of childbirth should be related to hockey. But <laughs> I, I, so I'm wondering if she had been having those thoughts and had gone down the path of, okay, I'm going to stop taking the pill to give me that option. Right. Mm -hmm. Should I decide? Should we have this conversation? I don't know. Hmm. So Interesting. I, I'm a little concerned that we're at like an hour already, that this is going to, this podcast is going to go longer than we're the not. movie. We're at 37 minutes okay. and he's going to edit some out. Okay. Good job, Jeff. <laughs> we Sorry. said nice things about you. Sorry. <laughs> All right. I will, I will. So do you want me to not go into detail? No, go in, go in. This is your movie. <laughs> okay. So then they leave the house and they go to... Pastor Phil, who is dating her mother, his church, and it's one of these rock and roll kind of new age churches, and they need a Mary and Joseph. And so, of course, you know, comedy ensues. Brad and Kate are going to play Mary and Joseph, and she's reluctant. And he, like you said, kind of a narcissistically steps into the role. And so he's not well, paying. The setup is she doesn't want to do it. Kate's not an idiot. She doesn't want to step in with 30, 30 minutes prep time, right? In front of this giant thousand member congregation. Right. And her mom says, no, you're stage trained. You were in Pippin. And she says something like, I wasn't Pippin. I was a tree. And then that comes back later several times when, when Brad's like, well, I'm not stage trained. I was never in Pippin. Right. <laughs> but then Vince just starts chewing the scenery as Brad. Brad goes face down into every cliche that I think the writers could think of, or Vince is just like that. I'm not sure which, but it was hilarious in my opinion. Yeah, it's another good, it's another really fun scene. And my favorite is when that scene is over, he, he gets in the car and he goes, you know what? I now know how Celine Dion feels. It's really exhausting giving all of that to the audience. Yes, yeah, it was, <laughs> that was hilarious. And because he said, he said like, Quite frankly, I thought I brought the whole thing home, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which when he delivered that line, there was something about it where I'm like, I, I could hear Vince saying that after they yell cut, right? Right. right. <laughs> Looking at Seth Gordon saying, quite frankly, I think I brought that whole thing home. So you're saying when she looked at him annoyingly, that maybe wasn't her optimal acting? She That was some yeah. real you feelings know, in there? I'd heard of directors like slapping the actor to get a certain reaction, so maybe... You cast an actor. Oh, as I said that, I would not put it past at least one director to tell one actor to irritate the other just to get that really authentic pissed off look. Yeah, I think that's looked down upon in this day and age because you, I, I think there were definitely directors, there are many examples that are well known of directors manipulating actors. And most actors say, trust that I know what I'm doing and I can get there, that you don't have to trick me into whatever emotion or... or... Oh, yeah. I trust my actors, but yes. I'm just saying I could see how a less scrupulous director might do that. Yes. So the third Christmas they go to is his mother. And at the very beginning, Kate says, I feel like we are not connecting, that you are not present. 
So Sissy Spacek obviously lives in Marin. She's wearing her turquoise and her beads. She has a very natural looking home. She mentions that she breastfed Orlando until he was five. There's a great line in there. The only one who was on my tits more was the professor I dated after your father. (laughs) What, what, What person wants to hear their mother say that? Right. Well, and to make matters worse, we find out that his mom is now dating his high school best friend and Sissy Spacek and his best friend go on to talk about how active their sex life is. <laughs> yeah. And that keeps coming back. So they decide to play a game because Kate sent ahead, obviously, all these presents. And one of them that she sent his mother was this game Taboo, wherein you're trying to get someone to guess a word and there are five words you can't say. And the, they're, it, they're the five most common words you would say. So that's the challenge. Right. Right. And so it harkens back. There's a, a point in the game where it's very much a who's who's on first because Brad's getting frustrated that Kate isn't playing the game because let's see, John Favreau and Katie Mixon are there and they are on fire. They are so in tune. She says like one of the clues is something on the nightstand and he gets it. Something I'm not allowed to wear to like the drag races. And he says mini skirt. So they're like clues that you would not give, but because right. they know each other so well, they're giving clues that only Dallas would know. And so they, they got like seven right. So Katie, you know, the pressure's on Kate and Brad and they've got to get this right. And so she tries to do it that way instead of just saying, like, I think it was shish kebab or something. <laughs> instead of saying, you know, something that you barbecue that's on a stick or whatever. She says, oh, shoot, I forgot what clue she gave. But anyway, she tries to go at it like, what did they call me when we went on vacation? And, <laughs> he, and he just has no idea. And so she's getting frustrated and she keeps trying to give clues from their own personal life. And he's not getting them. And he's he's getting frustrated because he's like, honey, you can go at this another way. You can give me clues th- about the word, not how they relate to us. So they end up kind of fighting. But before that, there is a hilarious scene where Sissy Spacek is buzzing him when he's trying to explain the game. And so he's saying all of the five words and he's, and he finally is just like, mom. (laughs) And it's another scene that I just laughed so hard. So I wondered whether they had to pay Taboo to use it in the, or did Taboo taboo like, yeah, yeah. that that they, Procter and Gamble or, because I don't know how you could really write that scene another way because the premise of that yeah. game, right, is, is well, so important. I think important. Taboo loved it. It's a commercial for how fun the game of Taboo is. Mm, well, um, um, <laughs> <laughs> if you're like, if you play it like Katie and Dallas. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Play, play, play it like them. Don't play it like Brad and his mom. Right. So this is where the film for me slows down a bit. And pretty much there's 23 minutes left. And they have a lot to get done. Because, because at this point, Kate pretty much decides we're not compatible. And I think maybe it's on the way to the fourth Christmas, which is her father, John Voight's house. She maybe I think that's when she admits that she did take the pregnancy test. And that's when he says you pulled the goalie. Or was that before? No, I think I think that's when it when it is. So, yeah, the car ride from his mom his to, mom her, to dad. her dad is definitely when, when it goes kind of south. And, and I see what you're saying about it felt like it slowed down a little bit. But I think that was part of the just how the the plot was going right well and i think the comedy in the first three christmases was so quick and so funny that maybe that's why this is now where the pathos needs to come in and this is where the conflict resolution has to come in and so it just felt like the pacing of it right well act three is not really that funny right no not at all now now they have to tie up all this stuff that they've opened up in the, in the first, you know, 80 minutes of the film or whatever. Right, right. And that was an, another place for a pause for us because we talked about this. I think we, we stopped it and talked about this last. So I'd say, too, this is more of the sentimental nostalgic, like her father. She's very sad. She basically has Brad drop her off at her dad's house and sends him on his way. He goes back to his dad's house to have a chat. And it's kind of when both of their fathers give them, you know, pass on that, that advice that only someone who has kind of seen their life and both, both fathers had unsuccessful marriages 
And so they can kind of impart some advice of what what it's like to be in a marriage and, you know, the compromises or, you know, what you do to get through it. When Brad goes back to his father's house, he realizes how similar he is to his dad. And that really bothers Brad. And he realizes that he doesn't want to end up like his dad, kind of cynical. And so he races back to her dad's house and he opens up the door and she's now spent some time and kind of made some decisions too. And he says, she opens the door and she says like, what are you doing here or something? And he just says, if we get one, we have to get two because they're like dogs. (laughs) Yeah, that scene is classic Vince Vaughn high Mm -hmm. speed patter. Mm hmm. Right. To the point that I did wonder how much he did, if not improv, did he, you know, consult on the dialogue? Mm Because it just, it sounds like that distinctive voice that, you know, Vince Vaughn, right? Yep. And so they kind of talk about it and decide that they both do want to start a family and they do. And I think they even discuss getting married, which at the beginning of the film, we knew that neither one of them really wanted to get married. And so that rolls into a scene where they're at the hospital and it very much bookends the scene at the airport in the beginning where their families discover that they're not able to go on their vacation because the a news reporter comes up to them. And now because they're having a New Year's baby, the news reporter comes into their room and says, oh, and I think we had just found out that they weren't letting their family members know that they had just had a baby. But now this news reporter has just interrupted that and thwarted those plans too. So it's, I think it's a cute bookend to say like, uh oh, here we go again. Like I'm surprised there wasn't a four baby showers. <laughs> well, maybe that was the sequel that just never got off never the ground happened, yeah. because Vince and Reese couldn't stand each other. So the idea of skipping Christmas and not telling your family to me is so much less egregious than not telling that you're going to have a grandbaby. So that to me said kind of like nothing had changed, right? Yeah, except for I felt like they probably knew they were having a baby. They just didn't make the phone call like, hey, her water broke. We're heading to the hospital. They were just going to wait until they had the baby and then go, hey, guess what? Kate had the baby last night and then deal with, I don't know. I mean, that's how I. Uh, Well, your version is happier. (laughs) That describes my head. So how about our, our normal features? Uh, did you notice a smoochie? I mean, we got a smoochie right off the bat in the bathroom at the beginning. Smoochie, smoochie, smoochie. Right. But the real first romantic smoochie is one hour, 17 minutes, 14 seconds when she kisses him on her dad's porch after he allows for children. Okay. After that whole interaction, there's a smoochie. Nice. And then let's see, head trauma. Yeah, we got that at 3115 when she slams the fake baby's head into the door jam. Okay, so that was it besides the wrestling that his brother That I made note of, yeah. Yeah, and then there was lots of driving in this because we had to drive from each uh, Christmas. Do you have a driving review? Well, they actually take the same vehicle the entire time. It's a black Range Rover, and this is great casting. Because the Range Rover instead of the Land Rover says that they're pretentious people because the Land Rover is what a person who really was going to go off road would have. The Range Rover is just for the yuppies who want to look like they're outdoorsy. So it was perfect casting of the vehicle. They got it in black, 2008. It was great casting. Good job. Should we go to the numbers? Let's go to the numbers. Okay. So this one came out in 2008. I don't know if I said that at the top of the show. It made, or it cost $80 million and domestically, it made that back plus 40, so 120 million, and worldwide, 164. So they doubled their investment in this movie. It scored a 5.7 on IMDb. Rotten Tomatoes did not like it. It is rotten at 25%, and the audience score isn't that much higher at 47%. So apparently, I do not align with most of America. Yeah. I- <laughs> That's a really low score for IMDb as well as Rotten Tomatoes. I I don't know why. So you're a little bit more, I mean, I don't think you would call this your favorite, but would you have given it, like, what would you give it in the, uh, out of 10? Seven, eight? Yeah, I'm probably seven or eight. Yeah. Right in there. It's good. It's a good film. It's It's got some really funny points. 
It's from New Line Cinema. It's an hour and a half. It's PG-13. It's a comedy drama romance. And it did win the BMI, winner of the BMI Film and TV Award. So yeah, it got well, an award. Yeah. Somebody liked it besides me. Yeah. I would love to know who else liked it. So please let me know, you guys, when you see our posts about it or shoot me a note at Chrissy at DodgeMediaProductions.com or drop us a line. Tell us what you thought at 971-245-4148. Please feel free to like, share, tell people, tell your friends about this podcast. If they're looking for Christmas movies, this is a great one to share with people. I would say definitely uh, the PG-13. I think, you know, you, you want kids to know that magical secret before you, you show them this movie because this one spills the beans. I think that is it for us. Merry Christmas, you guys. Next week, we will be talking about White Christmas, a classic Christmas film. And never forget. Dodges never stop and neither do the movies. Thanks for listening to Dodge Movie Podcast with Christy and Mike Dodge of Dodge Media Productions. To find out more about this podcast and what we do, go to DodgeMediaProductions.com. Subscribe, share, leave a comment, and tell us what we should watch next. Dodges never stop, and neither do the movies. 